and welcome back to the Market Authority Show. Today, I am joined by my dear friend and mentor, Lizzie Hofer. I've got quite the bio for you, Lizzie, so I want to make sure I get this right. <laughs> okay. I was reading this through, and it just reminded me of how awesome you are, so I really want to make sure I nail this for my That's audience. Great. Lizzie Helfer proves every day that passion changes everything. With sev over 17 years of mortgage industry experience, Lizzie works for Cross Country Mortgage, a leading independent mortgage banking company. And she started as a receptionist in the mortgage industry, um, but has worked her way up to become a top 1% originator and closed over 980 loans in 2019. And I'm sure that you are on track for similar or even more success this year. But that is so amazing, Lizzie. And I'm really excited to have you on this podcast because those numbers should tell everybody listening and watching today that you have so much value to bring. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Oh my God, you are too kind. And thank you so much. It's always funny hearing about yourself through someone else, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I have had uh, the unique privilege to have um, a front row seat to see your a lot of your journey, and you and I have been able to work very closely over the last couple of years. But for those who don't already know you, can you share a little bit about your story, about who you are, um, and where we're at today? Of course. Thank you. And by the way, you and Bryce are like two amazing real estate agents. You guys are such powerhouses and it's an honor to work with you. It's been fun watching you guys start like, you know, quit your nine to fives and then now just run this huge business. So thank you. And it's so awesome to be on your podcast. Um, <laughs> but uh, for those of you who've never met me, uh, so like she said, I've been in the mortgage industry for 17 years. I started, uh, you know, right in the first boom in 2002. So what led up to the first boom? Um, and I became a loan officer in 2008 when I couldn't find any more processing jobs. And I started with teaching agents about FHA loans and about credit and about just qualifying, just all the, the people that like were quote unquote difficult. Um, and so, you know, my most notable claim to fame is I actually um, was a top producer in my industry for a long time and got fired very publicly. Uh, and I had to own it and rebuild my career. And um, I've been able to, you know, grow from like a loan officer who did 167 deals a year to one that's closing over a thousand. And it's just been a really fun journey, but a lot of personal development along the way. Wow. So this year it, you're on track for over a thousand files closed. Yeah. We'll have closed over a thousand this month. That's incredible. So I want to acknowledge you for that because that growth happened to me. It feels like it was a very short period of time. You are not a legacy business. You were not, you didn't come from a legacy business rather. So this is something that you have had to build from scratch over like the last, like what, seven years since you've got fired or so six. So I, I was trying to think, I'm like, I got fired in 2014. Okay. So it's been six years of building what we know as the Lizzie Hofer team. And that was right before you and I met because we got in the business in 2015. And I remember meeting you at our brokerage and you were, you are still the power partner at our brokerage. And it was like, you've got to work with Lizzie. She's the best. And you were still like kind of just beginning, but immediately like we connected and you had such a presence anytime you were speaking in the room. And one thing that I loved about you was how hard you leaned into educating us agents in order to um, build better connections and trust with our clients who then, you know, get rewarded by your great service as well. Um, and something, I feel like that's been kind of a vein for your growth the entire time, but where, where did all of that growth happen? Like, so for those who don't know the story, like how do you go from getting fired to closing over a thousand files six years later? I mean, well, one, I mean, it's deep drive, right? So as entrepreneurs, especially if you've gotten into real estate or mortgages, um, we're dysfunctional people. We've, we're, we have chips on our shoulders, like all of us had it. Um, and so we're deeply motivated people. But one of my core fears and motivators is um, letting people down and being embarrassed. Uh, so there's no way to go other than like become a complete victim right? Or become a boss, 
when you're faced with something like getting fired, right? Uh, we all know people who've had something bad happen to them. And you know, those people that it's like, it's not their fault. Everyone else did this to them. And then, you know, the people that are like, you know what, I screwed up and this is what I'm doing. Right. So like, I couldn't let that be my legacy. I couldn't let it be like, I got fired and then I sued these people and, you know, went down that, like, just, it's just not me. Mm -hmm. And, um, I wanted to just prove to everyone that I could figure out a business that had great customer service and cared so much about people, but also could do big numbers. Right. And in the industry, it was always like, well, if you do big numbers, you can't really care about customer service. Yeah. Um, it's all about volume and process. And, um, part of the reason I got fired is cause like, I hate being embarrassed and letting people down. So I would completely freak out on the back end if something went wrong, you know, I was so terrified of like having a mistake happen that I was just a work terrorist. And so, um, I knew that the, the core motivator, like the core motivation for, for doing a good job is a good thing. Um, but how we communicate that to others, how we work with others, you know, um, that, that just could be improved. So, I mean, I, I, you know, humiliation is actually like what it just was. I mean, I just could not uh, wake up every day or go to bed every night without thinking about it. And it just was the thing that propelled me and made me work hard. I mean, those days were rough. I mean, I was waking up at like five in the morning to get to work at six so I could start processing my loans. And then, I mean, I had like very inexperienced people who uh, started my team with me who are amazing and now are like the foundation. But um, it was a lot of just like grit, passion, and just like, I'm not going to let myself go down as this weak link. So, you know, what's interesting to me about what you're sharing here is when I'm working with agents, one of their core struggles is consistency. It's the ability to show up every single day. That's where they tend to fall. And it sounds like so much of that was having an internal drive or that internal trigger to force yourself out of bed and get it out. Is that something that can be replicated in, in, in just, any professional or is that something that you just have to go through, you know, stuff and, and grow that on your own? So I think you just have to be willing to go there, right? Mm -hmm. So like I said, all of us are dysfunctional. We all have a chip on our shoulder, but we very rarely have a reason to feel it right? We're all really good at coping. We're all really good achievers. We know how to like manage the beast, right? Um, but for me, I mean, like my managing the beast actually caused an even bigger problem. And I had like a gigantic mirror to my face, right? Like this is you literally my worst fear getting fired publicly and having everyone know my garbage, right? Like talk about letting everyone down, <laughs> being embarrassed. Like, I mean, uh, um, so like, I just had to lean in so much to those fears, to those dysfunctions, to just, I mean, there was no way of not facing it every day. I mean, like, yeah, everyone has them. It's just, are you willing to like live in it? Right. Are you willing to own it, face it, like change it? So yeah. yes. Um, and, you know, and for most of us, we have short term motivations, right? Like somebody pisses us off or we have a new dream that we want to chase. Mm -hmm. Uh, but if you're not really, really living the motivation, like really feeling it, it, it you run out of steam, yeah. right? Like being humiliated publicly is like just in, I mean, it motivated me for years. I mean, I'm talking about like, literally like there were two years of my life where I did that 15 hour day schedule religiously. You know, my kids lived in my office with me, like <laughs> Annabelle's like sit for six months were like under my desk. <laughs> you know? So what keeps you going now? Because at some point you hit a level of success and you and I have had a couple of conversations about this in the past. Um, and I've always been satisfied with your answer, but I want to know if that's changed at all, especially after 2020, which has been kind of like a crazy year. Um, so what, what keeps you going in the middle of chaos and uncertainty? So at first it was that anger and humiliation, right? Like mm -hmm. anger and humiliation can do a lot for you. Um, I'm going to turn back on my lights. <laughs> um, but after a while, like you stop being angry, or at least I stopped being angry and I started working on myself. And so then it shifts to more curiosity right? For me, it was like, well, now I've reached this level of success that I never thought was possible for myself. Uh, and so what else can I do? 
And now I have this really great team with really amazing people who also have dreams and families and things that they want to achieve. And that curiosity also becomes um, ownership of their, of their dreams. Right. And so other people depending on you is also really great motivation. Um, so that's what it's turned into for me. Um, 2020 though, uh, I mean, I will tell you that, you know, you get really comfortable and then something happens like a pandemic where you have to like learn immediately to work from home. Right. And we're a very face-to-face -face business and we don't have structure. Right. Like, so like even learning how to transfer phone calls when everyone's at home using their cell phones, like, oh, it's yeah. just like, it's so hard, clunky. Um, I mean, we have really had to rebuild and redefine what business looks like with a tremendous amount of volume, with chaos, working situations, I mean, um, new team members, because some people just quite frankly couldn't make it in this craziness. So 2020 has been um, a year that reminded me of, of that foundation of not wanting to sacrifice service for volume and, you know, I mean, it has just rocked me to my, my core. <laughs> I'm exhausted and um, reminded myself of those 15 hour work days, which we had to, um, you know, that made a comeback in 2020. Uh, but it's, it's not fun having to go back to foundation. But I will say that getting back into the trenches, getting back into the basics of the business has really taught me a lot about one, things that have changed, efficiencies that need to be developed, how to really work in an environment where one, people are at home, they don't want to meet face-to-face, -face, you know, utilizing new technologies. So this will create an even better business for us, but it was very foundational, just like that 2014 year was for me. Just like tearing it down, figuring out all the issues, living in survival mode. I mean... Yeah. Where did you see the greatest pivots in your business so far? Was it in the way that you were communicating with existing clients um, and your existing database? Or is it um, maybe a change to the way you had been marketing yourself before? Because before, like if you, if I were to think about it, you were very face to face with a lot of real estate agents, which is kind of like the game plan. Like we in a way are your clients because we're the ones who are going to connect you with a bunch of, you know, the, the borrowers. Um, so how did that change or where were those big pivots and, and how did you deal with it? I mean, the biggest pivot honestly was learning how to work, work remotely as a team. That by far was the most difficult thing that I've done ever in my career. Okay. So just because managing all like, the pieces, all the different people, all the different personalities from afar. A hundred percent. And like just learning like what technology we had to implement to be able to communicate remotely in all different locations, right? With all different internet speeds and all different, like, I mean, it is interesting. Not everyone lives in an area with great reception and great internet. Um, you know, uh, hiring people from other states, right? So we had to get scrappy, right? There's not a whole lot of mortgage talent in Arizona, you know, believe Why it or not, do you think? in processing, in support, you know what I mean? Yeah. And we're dealing with like a ton of volume. So like the mortgage industry does normally like one to $3 trillion a year. We're doing 10 plus trillion, right? Like you just can't turn on that kind of faucet and expect people just to be looking for jobs. I mean, it is just nuts. So, um, that was the hardest thing, you know, um, second hardest thing is like, you know, taking everything that we did marketing wise and making it virtual. So learning how to do zoom seminars, which I mean, if you've never done a zoom seminar is weird. Like there's no feedback. I get a lot of energy from like people participating and asking questions. Nobody asks freaking questions in Zoom. I mean, it's nuts. Um, you know, or people don't need to see it in person because they think it's going to be recorded and they'll watch it later. Like it's such a, you know, it's just not the same. So uh, learning how to create value in video and value through a newsletter also became top priority. So where are the greatest, um, I, cause I agree, uh, especially when I'm working with agents this year, because I do a lot of mentoring. If you don't, if you don't already follow me, I do a lot of mentoring with agents as well too and stuff, um, for the audience. The biggest struggle is communicating a message over these platforms, right? Especially like to your point, when you're reliant on that feedback and measuring a person who's face-to-face -face with you, when that is suddenly gone, 
but you're still trying to articulate a message that's going to compel someone to do business with you over video or over audio that becomes very murky so what did you find was really important to you being successful in that new environment or are you still trying to figure it out so i think the thing is to provide content right that gets people to subscribe to something that is exclusive Right. So like I put out a ton of market information, a ton of buying information, but in order to get the really juicy stuff, you have to sign up for my newsletter. And if you have additional questions, you have to reach out to me. Right. So it's figuring out a good funnel for attracting people. Right. So understanding what your number one client's basic needs are. Right. Addressing it and then giving them your personal process for how you solved it. Right. And it has to be opinionated. It has to be um, somewhat controversial in a way that means that there is absolutely an opposing opinion, you know, and, um, and people will be attracted to that and they'll want more and they'll sign up and they'll continue down your sales path or you'll detract people. And that's also okay. Right. Because it saves you a lot of time, right? I don't have enough time to meet with all the people who reach out to us now. You know what I mean? As far as like referral partners and things, but I've learned and leaned and thank goodness I made this shift last year um, because, you know, I, I realized that we needed to do a lot more in terms of, you know, online marketing and having an online presence. So I think goodness we were ahead of the curve then because it became so essential with COVID. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just like you either want to attract or repel, but again, identify problems and have a, an exclusive process and then an exclusive pathway to additional information that comes from you. Which platforms are you seeing the most success there right now? So you have the most success on the platform that you consistently are on and respond to people. Mm -hmm. So that is it. So I've had success a lot with Facebook and then I moved from Facebook to Instagram. And then I had a lot of success there. And then I moved from Instagram to YouTube. I personally have like ADD when it comes to social media. It's just so much. So um, right now, the platform that I'm on the most is YouTube. Um, and secondary is Instagram. And then third is, is Facebook. And then fourth is LinkedIn. But I've had literal success on all of the platforms. When I participated on them on a consistent basis, reached out to people, provided value, responded to comments, you know, responded and supported other people. So um, that's my honest to God answer. But like right now, you'll see me the most on YouTube. Got it. I, I like this conversation a lot because it's something that has served us very well in our business too. Like you, we've always had um, kind of a strong foothold in social media and the way that we grew our business. So when the pandemic hit, it didn't change the way we did things really. We moved some meetings to a virtual environment. Um, and then I also had a baby. So I also had like my, my maternity leave and things would have gone virtual no matter what for us, but it didn't really change because we already had those really important pieces in place in terms of identifying the audience we're trying to get it in front of, having a qualification process like, like you do in terms of bringing down that sales funnel and letting them determine just from the messaging that you're putting out, um, whether or not you're a good fit for them. So how do you do that? Like, can you give me an example of identifying the people you're trying to get in front of and figuring out what their needs are and how you're creating a, a fun or a controversial or a compelling message for them? Like, can you give me an example of what that looks like? Because I can say that until I'm blue in the face, but I know that some people who are listening or watching are definitely going to want to like see an actual boots on the ground example of that. Would you be willing cool. to share? Yeah. So a lot of our clientele are first time home buyers and a lot of agents that deal with first time home buyers. So first time home buyers fears are one, the money that it takes to buy a home, right? So monthly payment, down payment, closing costs. And then they have a fear of not understanding the process, right? They live through times where their parents lost their homes, went through bankruptcies, lost their jobs. They're all children of uh, the recession. Yeah. And so knowing that those are their core fears, right? And that they understand the pathway through wealth is through home ownership, right? And that's a motivator. What ways can I provide value, right? So for me, as a loan officer, it always surprised me the number of people that sat down and wanted me to tell them what they could afford. Um, I think that's completely back, backwards, right? So just um, in general, like I think that you as a person 
should have a budget and know how much you feel comfortable paying and that that should dictate your home search and your purchase price. Now, that's an opinion, right? So that's my personal opinion. Um, now, the other opinion to that is how much should the one budget, right? So I came up with a formula that said, you know, if you budget to live on 70% of your net take home income, mm -hmm. right? So that gives you enough money to pay off debt, enough money to save. Uh, but 70% of that 70%, depending on your discretionary debt for it, spending for household goods, for additional debts, et cetera, that payment should be anywhere between 30 and 50%, right? Now that puts you in line with, you know, what the national average or the national statistics are for being house poor, right? So anybody living over 25% of their gross income, they consider you to be house poor, right? So this keeps you under that number um, and still gives you, you know, the ability to save and pay down debt. And so it's a fairly conservative number. It's definitely way under what people can max qualify for, for a mortgage, right? So there's gonna be some people that are like, screw her, she's saying I shouldn't buy a house, right? And I've literally had that kind of reaction. It's like, I've had people say, well, you don't think that poor people should own homes. And I'm like, I didn't say that, but if you do not have 30 to 50%, no, I think you should be living with somebody and paying down your debt or looking for additional you know, employment opportunities or different income streams. Right. Like I think this is the most successful way to own a home. And so again, right. Teaching people how to budget, how to save for their down payments, what programs have the least amount of like payments, right. Due to mortgage insurance or, you know, closing costs, the difference between buying rates down versus not buying down rates, you know? And so like being able to teach them these basic financial principles, right. One helps the consumer, but it also helps my real estate agents provide value to their clients because they can then take this information, educate their clients, but then also take it and just share it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so being partnered with somebody who has an opinion, who has a plan, right. And then creates value. Right. And so again, like you have to create something that's going to attract people. Now it doesn't attract everyone. Right. And that's like the, that's the beauty of it. Right. Right. But if there is no opposition to your program or to your belief system, it will not attract enough people. You'll just become part of the white noise. If people can Google your steps, it's already done. Yeah, I agree. And that to me is the way I see it is like the difference between screaming to a crowded room or like having an actual conversation that's going to move somebody closer to you. Um, and one thing that I love about what you're sharing is it's hitting on something that I think about a lot, which is having a brand that's relevant 100% of the time. Um, because I think where a lot of um, professionals in our industries get it wrong is they focus on the product and they see the product as the house or the loan itself. And as soon as somebody leaves that point in their life where they're actively looking to buy or sell a house, that no longer applies to them. However, you've found a way to provide value that goes far before and far beyond that initial purchase. Have you kind of seen that too? I do. And one of the other things that I think that most real estate agents and most loan officers like totally fail at is that they just take other people's opinions and other people's information and regurgitate it. Yeah. Like they just, you know, it's like whatever was said on the Cromford report, as if a consumer even knows what the Cromford report is. <laughs> it's like, this is what the experts are saying. Let me just go ahead and repeat it to you in language that you cannot understand. And like, and, and so what ends up happening is that the consumer doesn't trust us, right? They just are like, they're just selling for the moment. People want advice. They want expertise. They want to know if I buy in this time, when I believe that home prices are inflated, am I going to be successful? Is this going to hurt me in the long run? And that's the kind of stuff you cannot Google. That's the kind of stuff that isn't just available right? That's the information that consumers are seeking and will search in a YouTube video or will stop and watch an Instagram video on, right? And so when you're just talking about market statistics and you have no context and you're not speaking in a language that everybody can understand, this is where they totally lose. And I see literally 99% of real estate agents and loan officers marketing in this way. And honestly, it's like, like it does nothing, yeah, I couldn't agree more. And and I 
find that real estate agents, I am probably more exposed to real estate agents than loan officers, just, just on like initially on my screen. Um, but I see the exact same thing. And my favorite is when real estate agents fall into the trap of only sharing their own stats or their own successes. And every post is talking about an open house or under contract or sold. And it's like most if you talk to a consumer, they don't even know the difference between under contract or pending, first of all. And that's regional too. Like that's not even going to apply to a national audience because like a lot of MLSs don't even have under contract. Like that's not something that's going to work for somebody who's looking for a great real estate agent in Phoenix because they're moving from a different state. So it's really understanding. I totally agree. Like finding how that audience speaks and understanding the language and meeting them there because that's what's going to initially build that trust and that commitment to you through a screen. Um, yeah, so you can't be the hero in the story. Like if you're gonna just yeah. promote your own stats, it's like, okay, well, congratulations. Uh, but how does this help me, right? Like mm -hmm. they wanna be the hero. They wanna know how those stats are gonna save them money, save them time, eliminate stress, you know? And if it doesn't do that, then again, it's just a, what we call a humble brag. Like you might as well just own your brag and just be like, this is what I can do because I'm so awesome. Right. Yeah. You know? I think, I think that would be more compelling than just trying to like sliding humbled and honored to have. <laughs> I know. I don't, it's like, I just like, it's, what's the point? It's like, I just had the biggest month of my entire career. Thank you to all my friends and clients. And it's like, yes, yeah. but also it's like, what are you looking for? People just to say congratulations. Right. Right. Like bringing it down and understanding what the response is that you're looking for. Are you looking to be popular on these platforms? Are you looking for the likes? Are you looking for the follows? Are you looking for the views? Or are you looking for actual service inquiries from potential clients? Like for me, things got very easy when I removed myself from how many likes I was getting on a post or how many followers I was getting. When I removed that from the equation and literally focused on one thing, which was the number of appointments I was setting off of these apps, then it became very easy. Um, and that's when consistency kind of clicked for me. Um, so have you had, how have you seen this change and how have you seen this kind of pivot a little bit with the challenges that we're facing in 2020 because the messaging that I'm putting out today is not at all the messaging I was putting out in January of this year. So my messaging has been rather consistent um, just because I, I mean, so what's funny is I have to study the market all the time for my job. So I knew that the coronavirus is going to be a really big deal to our China trade war. And I started talking about it in November I and I started saying, Hey guys, you know, if anything goes wrong here, there's a bunch of conditions that are really conducive to a recession and what happens in a recession? Should you still buy? So the, the, messaging that I had been putting out a year ago actually was still very applicable to now. And the only thing that has changed there is that all of a sudden we are in a recession, but we're now in a housing boom. And so then it's explaining, okay, well, if you are buying in a housing boom, does it make sense? And so it's just kind of just translated to understanding, you know, what makes sense. And again, that whole smart steps that we taught, we teach people about for how to be a successful homeowner, it applies in any economy. And it, you can really show people that, real estate is a long-term investment. If you have owned your home, right. And you bought your first home in, in 2000. Okay. Right. In 2020, you have 10 years left on it, but that home has doubled in value. That's insane. Like what kind of investment can you ever purchase that doubles in value that you borrow to acquire, right? You have over a hundred percent return on investment for your initial investment. Mm -hmm. right? Like there's nothing like that. That's why real estate is so powerful. So when you use those concepts and explain to people, yes, you might be paying maybe 10 to 20% higher, but here's the difference with buying 20% higher with an interest rate that's in the twos versus an interest rate that's in the fours, mm -hmm. right? Interest rates in the fours, believe it or not, are higher at a lower value. So it's just explaining to people why real estate is a long-term investment, why it still makes sense, how to be a successful homeowner, 
And it applies in, in regardless of the market, but just being able to take that information and dissect it for what's current today, right? So like what they're hearing today um, is the only thing that's changed for me. But because I have a message for how people are successful, like that thing just ends up being consistent and then just reinforces how this was the smart method regardless of the economy, regardless of what's happening. Does that make sense? I know it's kind of... No, uh, for sure. And what I'm hearing is you were able to take kind of a timeless principle that you were able to distill down and explain in a way that your audience could digest and act on. And because it's a timeless principle, it is going to be applicable no matter what the economy is doing, no matter what you know, current events are and how they're impacting us at home, because we can still look back and, as you said earlier, take it back to the basics of um, this is what you're trying to accomplish. This is how you make it work for you. Is that kind of... Totally. And one of the other things that it did is like, you hear that I'm talking about the market, the economy, I'm talking about recessions, I'm talking about things that you wouldn't necessarily hear a real estate agent or a loan officer talking about, mm -hmm. right? And that's another thing that separates me from the competition, right? And as a real estate agent or a loan officer listening to this, it's one of the ways that you can be the market authority uh, for your sphere, for your community. And um, I didn't just like, like I've never, I'm not an economic major, right? An economy major, right? I didn't study economics in school. I um, just literally have to do it for my job, right? And because it was important, right? Because this is the other thing. Don't you find it frustrating that like, we have these super technical and legal obligations to our clients and yet people only know just the surface. Yeah. Like I can't just know that the bond market is related to the, to mortgage backed securities. I have to know how they're related, how they impact, how they move up and down, what things trigger the movements. Right. Mm -hmm. I became such a super nerd in those things. Right. And then that just all of a sudden made me the, the authority. Yeah. Right. It's like, no one gave me the title. I just made myself the title. Kind of like Gary Vaynerchuk made himself like the guru for marketing. <laughs> like no one gave him the title. He just like, I am this. Yeah. And then we all just said, yeah, you are. Well, after years and years of pounding it and pounding it on every single platform and bite-sized pieces of content, like dozens of times a day. And, and that's, what's so brilliant about social media is that's within all of our control. You know, you, when I, when I was talking with agents earlier this year, there was this huge fear mindset because suddenly there were factors impacting their ability to sell that were outside of their control. They couldn't do open houses. They couldn't do the door knocking. Nobody was answering their cold calls because it's election year and nobody's answering their phone at all. And so suddenly all these ways that they were used to procuring business weren't working. However, there are so many ways that you can still control the narrative on your end and control the way that people are engaging with you through these awesome platforms. And it really comes down to, as you're saying, your ability to identify what it is that sets you apart, how you can provide value in a way that's relevant, relevant and unique to the people that you're wanting to work with, and then just being consistent and articulate and hammering that in. Um, what do you see changing in 2021? So at the time of this recording, it's early November. What are you planning for as we head into a new year with, and I hate this word, with even more uncertainty and even more changing winds that are about to approach us? So um, I always plan for the worst. Okay, so this is just number one thing about me. I always plan for the worst and market for the worst case scenarios because for me, there's no penalty to that. It just means that I'm even more prepared if nothing happens um, or I you know, have even that much more market share if something does. Yeah. And so for me, I know that the first half of the year is gonna be just as busy as it is today. Uh, but I also know that where we are in terms of the average homeowner being able to afford the average home price here, I know we've capped out on that. And so things have to change. And so last time when we saw a market shift, it literally was two years before they even started acknowledging it, but it started taking place in the last quarter of 2005. So I personally believe that we will have a shifting market entering into 2021. And a shifting market, again, you just have to be so on top of it, right? What's relevant for your clients? Like, 
what information am I providing that still adds value to that? And I still have to be cognizant that people's biggest fears are going to be buying homes that they believe are going to be not worth what they purchased them for, right? Like that's, that's like a big fear right now. Or what happens if the housing market crashes? I can't even tell you how many videos are being put out on that right now because people are addressing people's fears. Mm -hmm. Right. And then understanding how, like, I mean, the market would have to drop 30% for that to happen, you know, and being able to educate them on why that it's unlikely. And even if they bought 10% higher, 20% higher, does that make sense? And so for me, I think it's going to be a shifting market. I think we have to be super cognizant of people's big fears and we just have to have messaging again, that is timeless and smart financially. Otherwise, we just come across as just used car salesmen just trying to sell people whatever house is available. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Are you already shifting your messaging to kind of be in line with that? Um, and are you like turning hard into it or is your plan to kind of just ease in as it happens? Nope, I've already put out a ton of video messaging that you can, you can all see it on my YouTube channel, just mm -hmm. talking about the market shift, like what makes sense, you know, you know, interest rates are going to be low until 2023. And again, just educating people, like if, even if you bought, let's say 2006, right? That was like the height of the market, right? The peak of values, right? Because values go up, believe it or not, guys, as markets are shifting. So the, that's what's confusing everybody, right? Is that the values are still going up, even though demand has changed, right? And so it's like a, a lagging indicator. And so if you bought in 2006 and you were selling today, you would have equity, you would have a mortgage that's almost half paid off, right? What does that do for you, right? If you were to wait, right? And then try to time the market for the bottom, like the market bottom was in 2011, five years later, you were going to wait five years to invest in home ownership. Right. I mean, and what were the penalties of that? What were the opportunity costs of that? Right. And so just, again, just these are opinions, right? These are like legit opinions, right? So just knowing that like, I have an opinion about what that is. And yes, I'm sharing it now. And let's say the market doesn't shift. Maybe it's just game busters. Okay. Again, I didn't give anyone advice that I wouldn't take even if the market did shift, right? Like this is legit advice that I'm giving people. It's like buy when your budget says it's ready, not when the economy says it's ready. You consistently buy stocks in high times and in low times, right? It's called dollar cost averaging, right? And when you do that, I mean, there's statistics that say like, if you like didn't do dollar cost averaging and tried to time the market, you would have like, I think it was like a $50,000 investment over like 20 years loses $800,000 worth of it. Like value. If you miss like the 10 most important days in the market, mm -hmm. like, and so you would have to buy for 20 years consistently to even take advantage of those. But I mean, it's just, it's crazy. So again, I, I know I ramble, but like <laughs> timeless, you know, pieces of information that apply in any economy is what we've got to go and just talk about what's applicable at the time in terms of market data and in terms of sales. So if you're telling this to somebody who's like, I hear you, Lizzie, I want to do this. And I think that I could probably accomplish this, but they're afraid of being wrong on the other end of it. They're afraid of giving wrong advice or they're afraid of coming across as like the advisor that they shouldn't be. What do you say to that agent who's just afraid to pull the trigger because of their own limiting beliefs? Like how many people that give advice and predictions are ever correct? Like truly, do you know what I mean? Like seriously, Ray Dalio is literally the best hedge fund manager that we have seen in our lifetime. You know how many times he's been wrong? More than he's been right, but the times that he's been right have made people so much money. My thing is like, I can't say for certain, I'm not a psychic. I don't know for certain that the market is shifting, but I know things that make that possible, right? Mm -hmm. So like incomes have an increase to be able to afford the average home. That has to impact housing. I'm a smart professional that says, you know what? I think this is impacting housing. And based on the last time, right? This is how long it took. Now I could be wrong, but this is why the advice I'm giving you works in any economy. Right. And it's like those people that are like, you need to buy now. And here's how you get this strategy. Here's how you win. Right. That's one way to do it. But if you're not telling people what the negative side effects of buying high, right? Like you got to own this for 10 years. Like if you don't say that, 
like that's when you maybe jeopardize somebody's finances. Like we have this uber important job, right? Like this uber important job that like impacts people's livelihood. We saw how it decimated families, right? People committed suicide, right? In the recession, like it, it was life and death. And I don't take that lightly. So it's important to be an expert in your field and give the best financial advice, right? Don't just try to make a sale. Like if you provide enough value, let me tell you the business takes care of itself. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And you know, it's, it's really important for everybody in this industry, I think, to understand that because what we do goes so far beyond just one sale. And if you want to be in business next year, two years, five years from now, you have to be treating your people right. And you have to be really coming from a place of sincerity um, and a place of honesty and integrity. I think those are all really important. And I think that people can smell that a mile away. When your messaging comes from that place and people understand that you are just trying to show them options and give light to their two different paths that they could take, that is when that trust is built. And that's when clients come to you in droves. That's when they seek you out. Um, is, that, is that kind of what you feel too? Or is that just me? Uh, no, I, I hundred percent. Now, one thing that I will say, I think most people's intention is to be honest. Um, but I think that their lack of knowledge on market yes, is yes. what does it like they literally sell based on what happens today. Like mm -hmm. the market is going up today, right? We've seen literally double digit appreciation in four months. Now, if I was going to base you buying a home and tell you, guess what? This home appreciated 15% since you bought it in May. I would be doing them a disservice one because they're going to be, they're selling based on capital gains. Markets ebb and flow, right? It, it's silly to think, right? Like for instance, I bought the zoom stock literally on day one. Okay. It's up like 800%. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm not a genius cause I bought zoom. I liked the company. It was going public. It made sense to me. I had no idea that it was going to go up 800%, right? But if somebody was like, oh yeah, this has gone up 800%. It's going to keep going up. It's such an amazing company. It would be dumb to think that one, there aren't going to be competitors that come into the market that take market share. It's also like people are going to find problems with the Zoom. Zoom conferences haven't worked out that well, right? Like people are going to discover that they like being person to person. Right? Like this, these are going to be things I promise you that will happen. It would be dumb of me to think that it's just always going to go up. Right. Right. And so now I say that, but like, that's how people sell real estate. Like this is what, oh, you better buy now. You're going to be priced out of the market. You better buy now. Oh, if you, if you can sell it in two years and you'll have made all this kinds of money. Like, I think that that's dumb, but honestly, it's, I think it's ignorant and I don't think it comes from a place of dishonesty. I think it comes from a place of optimism and just ignorance. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And you know, if we're all in this for the long run and we're all in this to be building a business, that's a legacy and not just a job for a couple of years to tide us over until the next thing comes on. I think that's a really important um, way to be. Um, well, as we start dialing this down, can you share a little bit about where people can find you um, if they want to hear more from you? Yes. So um, uh, my name is Lizzie Hofer. So it's Lizzie with one Z and a Y. Uh, and it's Hofer, H-O-E-F-F-E-R. So if you put that into Google, you'll find my Facebook, my website. Um, I have a YouTube channel. On Instagram, my name is Lizzie Irvine. Um, Irvine is actually my married name. I have an amazing husband um, named Skylar Irvine who does podcasting and marketing and all that fun stuff too, if you find him. Um, but that's where you can find me. I'm basically, it's so hard not to find me, <laughs> right? I mean, there's just so much content out there. So that's, that's it. In a nutshell. Okay. Great. And I'll have links to some of your channels in the show notes as well. Um, and then last question for you, what's one piece of advice you could leave? Like if people were to take one thing from this chat going into 2021, what are you leaving them with? So, so 2021 is going to be another brutal year. So you're going to have to figure out how to like 
get persistence, figure out how you're going to sustain your motivation, your energy level. And then you're going to have to be super flexible, right? Because I think things are going to be like all over the place. So, I mean, so getting a really dialed in routine, um, staying super healthy, right? Working out, getting enough sleep, drinking water. I mean, uh, uh, you know, it's just general advice anyway, but I think we're gonna need that extra energy. One, to fight burnout, I think to stay consistent, you know, obviously to not get coronavirus, uh, but I mean like it applies in a variety of different ways, but as business people, I think that we forget about our own endurance and I don't think we take care of our, ourselves the way that we need to, to be able to pivot and work the kind of hours that we're gonna work in a crazy shifting market. I love it. I couldn't agree more. Well, Lizzie, thank you so much for joining me today. I love all of our conversations. And you guys, if you don't already follow Lizzie, you've got to check her out. And, and she practices what she preaches. So if you want to hear this stuff and see what it looks like in applied to real life, go follow her. Listen to all the things she has to say. Lizzie, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Appreciate you. And there you have it. I hope that you enjoyed that discussion with my friend Lizzie Hofer. She has so much to offer and I do encourage you to check out all that she has on her YouTube channel and her Instagram. Those links are below so check that out when you get a moment. And by the way, you may have noticed that Lizzie was sharing about how important it is to really nail down the messaging behind your brand and figure out ways to share relevant, unique value propositions with the clients that you're trying to find on social media. If you're looking for a little help in that department, you may want to consider checking out my mentorship program, the Market Authority Academy, where we dive into exactly step-by-step -step how to position yourself as the authority in your market using brand forward social media strategies in 2020 and beyond. If you are interested in that kind of thing, the links are below. You can apply anytime. And there's also a free social media training that I offer linked below as well. That's going to share some hacks and tips that you can begin using right away to see results in your business. Thank you so very much for tuning in. And until next time, keep on crushing it.